Hey guys, uh, if you're following along with the Subaru videos, I ran into a delay with the windstorm we had. I put up a picture on my Instagram of the kind of damage we had around here. We didn't have power for a few days, so no working and no editing for me. But let's get back into it. In this video, I'm going to show you how I took apart the Subaru EJ25 engine. This might not be the perfect way to do it, but it worked for me. I'm going to put links into the description box below if you want to skip to a certain part. The first thing I did was remove the alternator and the bracket that it is held on. It is held on by four bolts. I placed all the bolts I removed into individually labeled baggies. This helps me with reassembly. You can even number the bags so you know what order to put everything back on. Next I removed the ignition coil and wires. This is optional but I just wanted it out of the way. The wires are labeled to differentiate what cylinders they go to. The coil itself is held on by three bolts, 10 millimeter if I remember correctly. Once that's out of the way, I remove the O2 sensor connectors from the front. They're held on by a little tab that needs to be lifted and the connector slid off the metal bracket. Then I remove the metal fuel injector covers. Originally I tried removing the wire harness before the intake manifold, but it was very annoying and it just turned out to be a waste of time. So it's much easier to remove the intake with the harness still attached to it. You just need to remove the O2 sensor connectors from the front. There are three connectors on the back of the passenger side cylinder head. There's the main harness connector on the back, three connectors on the front of the driver's side cylinder head, and two connectors on the front of the engine. There's also one connector behind the intake that goes to the knock sensor. The intake manifold itself is held on by four bolts on each side. There's also a metal pipe that connects the driver's cylinder head with the intake. This is for the PCV system. There are some coolant hoses that go to the throttle body. You need to remove those. I could be forgetting something, but I'm pretty sure that should cover just about everything needed to remove the intake. Now take a look at how clean these intake valves are compared to the direct injected Audi. I heard the new Subaru engines like the Scion FRS and the Subaru BRZ have dual injectors, both direct and port injection. This is to help combat the carbon buildup that direct injected vehicles have. The next thing I did was loosen the crank pulley bolt. I used the pry bar stuck in the engine stand bracket to catch on the pins on the flywheel while I loosened the bolt. In the knock diagnosis video earlier, I showed you how you can place the car in a high gear and hold the brakes to allow you to loosen the crank bolt, but obviously we can't do that here. Before I remove the crank pulley, I use the timing marks to set it at top dead center before I remove the timing belt. I use the white marker to mark the notch on the pulley and the zero line on the cover. Once that's marked, I went ahead to remove the timing covers, but when I took off the cover, the arrow on the cam pulley doesn't line up with its mark, so that means I'm not at top dead center. I need to turn the crank another 360 degrees to line up both the cam and crank marks. Then I marked the timing belt and both cam pulleys before removing the timing belt. I decided to remove everything off the top of the block before removing the timing belt. There is an aluminum coolant pipe, the oil pressure sensor, another coolant pipe, the dipstick tube, the oil tube, the crank position sensor, the knock sensor, the bracket for the air intake, and the belt guard for the timing belt. This guard is only on manual cars. I started removing the timing belt by loosening the cam pulley bolts. If you don't have an impact, you might need to hold the crank bolt so you don't move the timing marks. Then I removed the tensioner, but I later found out in the repair manual that you're supposed to remove this idler pulley instead. Once the belt and pulleys are removed, I started the hardest part of this job, removing the valve covers. I had no idea this was going to be such a pain. The bottom bolts on both sides were seized from corrosion. I was able to loosen the top bolts just fine, but I stripped three of the six bottom bolts and needed to grind them off. I can't imagine doing this with the engine in the car. If you work on Subarus, please tell me how do you get around this if the engine's in the car and the bolts are seized. Both valve covers were a pain to remove, but I finally got it done and now it's time to remove the heads. Each head is held on by six 12.12 millimeter bolts. They're on there very tight. When removing them, it's recommended that you do so in reverse of the tightening sequence. 
This involves loosening in steps to keep the heads from warping under the pressure. After I took off both heads, I put the short block on the ground to finish removing all the external pieces. Let's start with the flywheel. It's held on by 8 bolts. Be careful when you loosen them so you don't drop the flywheel. It's quite a bit heavier than it looks. Back at the front of the block, there is an aluminum bracket that needs to be removed as well as the water pump. This is held on by 7 bolts. The final piece is the oil pump. After removing the 7 bolts, I had to use a pry bar at the tabs along the edge to separate the pump from the block. With the metal shavings in the oil, I'm not sure if this pump is going to be reusable, but we'll take it apart later and see what it looks like inside. But now this block is ready to be split into halves, but that will be another video. Thanks for watching and tune in next time as I show you how I split this block apart to check the internals.